the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. We welcome everyone to the National Shrine, the Divine Mercy, at our live stream healing mass on the solemnity of Corpus Christi, in which we honor the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. What happens at every single mass where the Lord gives us his body and blood in the forms of bread and wine. And so that's why we're going, that's why we have incense today. We have what are called smells and bells. If you like smells and bells, this is the mass where we have a lot of smells, a lot of incense, symbolizing our prayers, being lifted up to God, and bells and solemnity in which we honor this great gift of love that God gives us at every Mass, the gift of the Eucharist. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God, God and to you, my brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters that I have that greatly, I sinned, greatly sinned in my thoughts, my thoughts and in my words, in my words and what I have done and what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault, therefore I ask, bless Mary, ever virgin, all the angels and saints, and to you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us of our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray, O oh God, who in this wonderful sacrament have left us a memorial of your passion. Grant us, we pray, 
so to reveal the sacred mysteries of your body and blood that we may always experience in ourselves the fruits of your redemption. We live and reign with God the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Deuteronomy. Moses said to the people, Remember how for 40 years now the Lord your God has directed all your journeying in the desert so as to test you by affliction and find out whether or not it was your intention to keep his commandments. He therefore let you be afflicted with hunger and then fed you with manna, a food unknown to you and your fathers, in order to show you that not by bread alone does one live, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of the Lord. Do not forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that place of slavery, who guided you through the vast and terrible desert with its seraph serpents and scorpions, its parched and waterless ground, who brought forth water for you from the flinty rock and fed you in the desert with manna, a food unknown to your fathers. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because the loaf of bread is one, we, though many, are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the Jewish crowds, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. At every Mass, every Mass that is done, whether it's here in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, or it's a Mass in some other country, a town, a city, a village, wherever you have a Mass and a valiantly ordained priest, a miracle happens. At every Mass, you can't see it. You can't see it, but a miracle happens that we, here we have the word. When we proclaim the gospel, we have the word of God. The word of God is to inspire us, is to inflame us with great love for God. But then the word became flesh through Mary. And Jesus came down from heaven to this earth and the word became flesh. And now that Jesus has ascended into heaven, he's still with us. That the word became flesh at every mass, a miracle happens because the bread now becomes the body and blood of Christ. Once the priest invokes the Holy Spirit, what's called the epiclesis, when he does this, that's the Holy Spirit time. So there, there are certain gestures that the priest does that's invoking something spiritual, invocation of the Holy Spirit and the words of consecration that the bread no longer becomes bread. It is now the body and blood of Christ. The wine no longer becomes wine, but now it becomes the body and blood of Christ. That's why Jesus said, I am the living bread. He said, I'm the living bread. He said, my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Most of the heresies against the Eucharist say it's only a symbol. Say it's only a symbol, it's only a sign. It's not really the true body of Christ or the true blood of Christ. And I would love someone to say, prove it to me. You ever have someone that's very scientific? Prove it to me. Prove to me that at every mass throughout the world, when a priest takes bread and wine and invokes the prayers and the power of the Holy Spirit, that at every mass, that that bread and wine is changed into the body and blood of Christ, prove it to me. And so today, I'm going to show you, God has proof. So God is scientific. He's not just theological. I could give you all the theological documents in the world, and you still won't believe. How many people still don't believe? The bishops can write documents. The pope can write documents. I could be here giving you document after document, encyclical after encyclical, catechetical teaching, and how many people still leave the Catholic Church? 
and say, I don't want anything to do with it. But now, what if the Lord does something, not just a document, but something extraordinary, a miracle? That the Lord does a Eucharistic miracle to show us what happens at every Mass, but does it in an extraordinary way throughout the centuries, even up to our time. So I want to relate to you, I want to prove to you that at every Mass, an extraordinary miracle happens that we don't see, but the Lord has shown us throughout the centuries. And I want to relate some Eucharistic miracles to you. In my talk yesterday, I related a Eucharistic miracle in Bosena, Italy, that helped to establish the Feast of Corpus Christi, what we celebrate right now. There have been Eucharistic miracles that have actually had scientific investigation that even proves that there's no scientific explanation. When science gets in, they don't, they don't say it's a miracle. They just say that there's nothing that science can explain. And I'd like to go through a miracle that happened centuries ago, about 12 centuries ago, and Eucharistic miracles that have happened in, in this century, in the 20th century and 21st century. So the first Eucharistic miracle that had happened was in Lanciano, Italy. It's one of the most famous in the eighth century. If you've never heard of it, this is great. If you've heard of it, it's always great to hear a story again and hear it again and hear it again and hear it again so that it gets through our thick skull. It gets through our ears. It gets through our hardened hearts because we need it. So this happened with a Brazilian monk who had doubts about the Eucharist. So he's having doubts that Jesus is really present when he invokes the Holy Spirit and says the words of consecration. So what happened during the mass itself, the consecration itself, the host was changed into live flesh and the wine was changed into live blood which coagulated into five globules, irregular and differing in shape and size. The host flesh can be very distinctly observed today. It's still there. You can observe it. You can go online and observe. There is an actual piece of flesh. It has the same dimensions as the large host used today in the Latin church. It is light brown and appears rose-colored when lighted from the back. The blood is coagulated and has an early color resembling the yellow of ochre. Various ecclesiastical investigations were conducted since 1574. In 1970-71, and taken up again partly in 1981, there, there took place a scientific investigation by the most illustrious professors in Italy. The analysis were conducted with absolute and unquestionable scientific precision, and they were documented with a series of microscopic photographs. These analyses sustain the following conclusions, that the flesh is real flesh. The blood is real blood. It's not fake. The flesh and the blood belong to the human species. The flesh consists of the muscular tissue of the heart. In the flesh, we see present the my myocardium, the endocardium, the vagus nerve, and also the left ventricle of the heart for the large thickness of the myocardium. The flesh is a heart complete in its essential structure. The flesh and the blood have the same blood type, AB, as the Shroud of Turin. In the blood, there were found proteins in the same normal proportions as are found in the seroproteic makeup of the fresh normal blood. That means the blood is living. In the blood, there were also found these minerals, chlorides, phosphorus, magnesium, potassium, sodium, and calcium. The preservation of the flesh and of the blood, which were left in their natural state for 12 centuries and exposed to the action of atmospheric and biological agents remains an extraordinary phenomenon. This is from the eighth 
century. You could go online, Lanciano, look at the pictures. There's an actual piece of flesh that was once bread in the eighth century. And it's flesh that's now a heart, it's heart, it's heart tissue, it's living tissue. And it was not mummified for 12 centuries. It, 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 the, the, you know, there was no mummification. Think about that. Take a piece of bread from your cabinet and put it out. See if it's going to last 12 centuries. See if that bread is going to last 12 centuries. Well, maybe it, it might if it has all kinds of preservatives. With our preservatives today, it might last 12 centuries. But bread doesn't last 12 centuries. So there's no scientific explanation of this Eucharistic miracle of Lanciano. But you could say, ah, that was back in, you know, 12 centuries ago. Does the Lord does something today? Does he do something today? I had someone come up to me and say, Father, there's no miracles today. Oh, there isn't? Father, there's no miracle. I don't see miracles today. You don't? Well, I'm going to relate to you three miracles that happened recently. Eucharistic miracles to prove, again, as Lanciano and other Eucharistic miracles, that what we believe, or what we should believe as Catholics, happens at every Mass. The first is in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And this was when Pope Francis was Archbishop Pope Francis actually witnessed this miracle. And it was at the same parish, it was actually three Eucharistic miracles that happened, 1992, 1994, and 1996. That's pretty recent. The parish of St. Mary in Buenos Aires was the site of these three Eucharistic miracles. On May 1st, 1992, after Mass, a Eucharistic minister was placing a reserved consecrated host into the tabernacle when he noticed two pieces of consecrated hosts have fallen onto the corporal, the cloth on the altar. A priest was called who placed the host into a vessel of holy water as dictated by church procedure and then into the tabernacle. On May 8th, it was discovered that the host fragments had become a reddish color. Then on May 10th, during evening masses, drops of blood were observed on the patens, the small plates that hold the consecrated hosts. Then two years later, on July 24, 1994, while a Eucharistic minister went to get the picks from the tabernacle, he noticed a drop of blood running along its side. Then two years later, on August 15, 1996, during Mass, a consecrated host was found in the back of the church in a candle holder. Father Alejandro Pizet retrieved the host, which was dirty, and placed it into a vessel of holy water to dissolve. On August 26, it was discovered that the host had several stains of blood. These stains became larger every day afterwards. Only this miracle was investigated. Archbishop Jorge Bergoglio, Pope Francis of Buenos Aires, was contacted. He immediately had the host professionally photographed. For reasons which are not clear, it was decided not to publicize the event. Or, and to keep the host in the holy water. The host stayed this way for three years and never decomposed. In 1999, a scientific investigation was begun under the leadership of Ricardo Castañón Gómez of Bolivia, a clinical psychologist who specializes in brain chemistry. Eight scientists were involved in this investigation from four continents. On October 21st, 1999, Castagnon brought a sample to a forensic laboratory in San Francisco to do analysis. On January 28, 2000, scientists found fragments of human DNA in the sample, but not enough to produce amplified DNA. Dr. Robert Lawrence, a top histopathologist who studies tissues, found human skin and white blood cells upon further analysis. He stated in an interview that the white blood cells were living at the time they were collected, even though they normally die within two hours after being taken from a body. In 2001, Castagnon sent samples to Dr. Eduardo Linoli in Arezzo, Italy, 
who said the sample was heart tissue and had white blood cells. White blood cells means that it's living, that the tissue is living. This is from a host. This is from a host at mass. In 2002, samples were sent to Dr. John Walker of the University of Sydney in Australia, who said that the sample was muscle cells with intact white blood cells. On March 2, 2004, samples were brought to New York for analysis by Dr. Friedrich Zugibi, a famous cardiologist and forensic pathologist at Columbia University. He was not told what the sample was. Zugibi found that the sample was heart muscle near the left ventricle. It was inflamed and had white blood cells, meaning the heart was alive and pumping when the sample was taken. The heart showed signs of being under severe stress. When told that the sample came from a consecrated host, Zugibi was speechless. Zugibi was also an atheist. He was an atheist. Castagnon was an atheist when he began the investigation, but converted to Catholicism by the end of this investigation. The Eucharistic Miracles does not have, well, it does have church approval. Now, the problem is that they waited so long, it took so long to get the genetic sample. So they found that this Eucharistic miracle was of the heart, same as Lanciano. And they found that the blood type was AB when they did further investigations. They found that the blood type was AB, which is a miracle, which is the same as the Shroud of Turin. And this is a host. This is a piece of bread that was consecrated at Mass that happened. Then there was another Eucharistic miracle that happened in Tisla in Mexico. On October 21st, 2006, St. Martin of Tours Parish in Chipanchingo, Chalapa Diocese in Mexico held a retreat. Two priests and a nun were distributing communion during mass when the nun suddenly turned with tears in her eyes to face the priest next to her. The host that she was holding had begun to ooze a reddish substance. And the bishop did a scientific investigation. Again, he contacted Castagnon to do research between 2009 and 2000. And 12. Then they presented their conclusions in 2013. The reddish substance was found to be blood with hemoglobin and DNA of human origin. Two studies were conducted by prominent forensic experts using different methods. Both showed that the blood originated from the interior of the host, excluding the hypothesis that someone could have placed blood in the host from the outside. The blood type was AB, the same blood type that was found in the host of Lanciano and on the Holy Shroud of Turin and Buenos Aires. Microscopic analysis showed that the exterior part of the blood had been coagulated since October 2006. The interior layer of the blood was found to be fresh. Intact white blood cells, red blood cells, and macrophages were found, whatever that is. The tissue was found to be heart muscle called myocardium. At the time of testing, DNA remnants were found, but not enough to produce amplified DNA. On October 12, 2013, the bishop declared that what had happened in Tisla was a Eucharistic miracle. It had not yet been approved by Rome. Now, there's a third one, or there's a fourth one, actually. And this one happened in Poland. This was Sokolka, Poland. On October 12, 2008, in St. Anthony's Church, a consecrated host fell to the ground during Mass. A woman who had been kneeling in order to receive communion told the priest who immediately placed the host into a silver vessel with holy water. At the end of Mass, the sacristan, Sister Julia Dubowska, took the silver vessel and poured it into another vessel for increased safety. She then placed that vessel into a safe where the chalices were kept. On October 19, 2008, Sister Julia opened the safe and smelled the aroma of unleavened bread. She then noticed that the host was partially dissolved with strange red clots in the center. She told the pastor who showed the host to two other priests. The Metropolitan Archbishop was called who came to see it. On October 30th, the host was taken out of the holy water by orders of the Archbishop and placed on a corporal. 
and put into a separate tabernacle in the rectory. The samples were sent to two laboratories in 2009. Pieces of the host were sent to doctors Maria Sobianek Lotowska and Stanislav Sokolsky. Both scientists work at the Medical University of Bialystok as histopathologists, doctors who diagnose diseases in tissues and organs. When the samples were analyzed, the undissolved part of the host was embedded in the cloth. The red blood, blood clot was bright. Both studies concluded that the sample was myocardium, that's of the heart of a living person who was near death. The heart muscle fibers were intertwined with that of the bread as if the host had transformed partly into flesh. According to the declaration of Sobyanek Latovska, this was something that was impossible for human beings to do. No foreign substance was found in the sample. There has been no public information on a DNA test done on the Sokolka host, et cetera, et cetera. There, there, there's more on it. What's amazing about all these modern Eucharistic miracles, they could not obtain a DNA profile, which is impossible. They could not obtain a DNA profile. Why is that? Because half of Jesus' DNA is divine. Think about that. Half of it. Half of it's from the Blessed Mother, human, and half of it's divine. But they cannot obtain a DNA sample. All of these Eucharistic miracles all point to heart tissue that's living, that's still living. As someone who is, who is beaten, who has severe inflammation. The blood type is the same, AB. And these are taken from hosts at the Mass. That's why every Mass is a miracle. Every Mass is a Eucharistic miracle. Sometimes our Lord shows it to convince us of the truth of the Gospel. We don't need Eucharistic miracles for our faith, but some people do. Some people do need to be convinced of what we believe, of what happens at every Mass. And recently, these are, are not approved, but recently, I think, it, I think it was in Mexico, that during Eucharistic adoration, the people saw the host was beating like a heart. You actually see that on video. And recently, it was in Connecticut. This is still under investigation. So I won't say this is a Eucharistic miracle, still under investigation, that there, were, there was something that happened of a multiplication of the hosts at the Mass that happened. This was recent here in the United States in Connecticut. It's still under investigation, so we leave the final judgment up to the bishop. This is why Jesus says, I am the living bread come down from heaven, that he's living that every host is alive with Jesus Christ. And every host that we receive lives within us and brings us eternal life. Okay, that's why Jesus says, my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. We have scientific proof here about the Eucharist. And there might even be people that say, I still don't believe. I still don't believe. And what I would say to those unbelievers, I would say, okay, you still don't believe. We have scientific proof that proves that the Eucharist is what we believe, the true body and blood of Christ. I would say, disprove it then. Disprove it scientifically. You say it's not the body and blood of Christ. Disprove it scientifically. Do a scientific analysis then to disprove what we believe as Catholics happens at every Mass, that we receive the true body and blood of Jesus Christ. Disprove it then. Disprove it scientifically. Not just your whatever, you know, they, they always say in forensic files, people lie, but science doesn't lie. People can lie, but science does not lie. Prove it scientifically. Because if you can't pr disprove it scientifically, then you have to humble yourself and believe that what we do at every Mass 
is a Eucharistic miracle. Though you can't see it, and the Lord can work a Eucharistic miracle whenever he wants. I always say to the Lord, Lord, please, don't you work a Eucharistic miracle on my hands. I don't want all that publicity and everything. I believe, I believe you don't have to do that. You don't have to change your flesh and have it bleeding all over. And the seminarians did a wonderful job with the altar. And we don't want blood all over for our 1030 mass and procession and everything. We don't want all that blood. And I believe you don't have to do that. But if he wants to, he could. He could. It's not up to us. That is why there's a miracle, a Eucharistic miracle that happens at every Mass. And if it happens at every Mass, wouldn't you want to come to Mass? Not just because someone tells you to come, but wouldn't you want to come and receive the living bread that has come down from heaven, which brings you eternal life, which will raise you up on the last day and give you life, life that you can't bring yourself but life that comes down from heaven, divine life that will bring you life. All we need is humility and faith to receive the precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ in Holy Communion and the Eucharist at every single Mass. Let us stand now to profess our faith. I believe among God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe among Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things are made, for us men and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate in the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds in the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess in baptism for the forgiveness of sins, that I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Jesus offers his body and blood as a sacrifice to bring us eternal life. Trusting in his love, let us offer to our Heavenly Father all of our prayers and petitions. For the church, Christ's body on earth, may God strengthen us to enjoy, to joyfully live our faith, bringing glory to our Heavenly Father. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who hold political or civic authority, May God guide them in protecting and providing for the weak, especially those who have no voice. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For broken and wounded families, may the love of Christ bring healing and reconciliation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For this community of faith, May the Holy Spirit inspire us in every word and deed. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our beloved dead, may they, receive, may they receive his body and blood in this life. May Jesus receive them into his heavenly kingdom. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for all the intentions and the silence of our hearts.
Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all the members of the Association of Marian Helpers and the Confraternity of the Immaculate Conception, both living and deceased, for all the intentions they have entrusted to us, as well as those who call or write to us, may the Lord favorably hear their prayers and strengthen them in faith, hope, and love. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Loving God, hear our prayers and answer them according to your holy will. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Grant your church, O Lord, we pray, the gifts of unity and peace, whose signs are to be seen in mystery in the offerings we here present, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right it is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord, for at the Last Supper with his apostles, establishing for the ages to come the saving memorial of the cross, he offered himself to you as the unblemished lamb, 
the acceptable gift of perfect praise, nourishing your faithful by the sacred mystery. You make them holy so that the human race, bounded by one world, may be enlightened by one faith and united by one bond of charity. And so we approach the table of this wondrous sacrament so that bathed in the sweetness of your grace may pass over to the heavenly realities here foreshadowed. Therefore, all creatures of heaven and earth sing a new hymn, a new song, and adoration. And we, with all the hosts of angels, cry out, and without end we acclaim. indeed holy O Lord the fount of all holiness make holy therefore these gifts we pray by sending down your spirit upon them like the dewfall so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ at the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion he took bread and giving thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take this all of you and eat of it for this is my body which will be given up for you In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, take this all of you and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly, we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and William, our Bishop, and all the clergy, Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep and the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, to may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever.
At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Delete us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, Lord, I am not worthy worthy that you should enter under my roof, roof. but only say the word, word, and my soul soul shall be healed. May the body of Christ keep me safe for eternal life.
act of spiritual communion and thanksgiving. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most blessed sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Entry 1067 in the Diary of St. Faustina. During the Mass of Resurrection, I saw the Lord in beauty and splendor. He said to me, My daughter, peace be with you. He blessed me and disappeared, and my soul was filled with gladness and joy beyond words. My heart was fortified for struggle and sufferings. Let us pray. <coughs> Grant, O oh Lord, we pray, that we may delight for all eternity and that share in your divine life, which is foreshadowed in the present age by our reception of your precious body and blood, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. There is an ancient expression in the church, I don't know who it comes from, it says, for those who believe, no explanation is necessary. For those who do not believe, no explanation will suffice. So believe, pray for that gift of faith. Faith is a gift that we have to keep praying for at every Mass. Every time we come to the Mass, we have to pray for that gift of faith because the, it's the great mystery of faith, the Eucharist. So keep praying for that gift of faith. If you find it wavering, going down, pray for it, pray for it. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit, that gift of faith. So a couple of announcements today. First announcement, after the 1030 Mass, that's the next Mass, we're going to have a uh, Corpus Christi procession. So you're more than welcome to join the Corpus Christi procession outside after the 1030 a.m. Mass. And then we will have extended Eucharistic adoration today after the Corpus Christi procession. And second announcement is on August the 5th, we're having our Spanish Day celebration. It's called Encuentro Latino. We are looking for volunteers, if, especially for Spanish speaking. Uh, Spanish speaking volunteers will really help, but it's not necessary. You could be English speaking. On August the 5th, please go to shrineofdivinemercy.org. Look under volunteers where you can sign up to be a volunteer for our Encuentro Latino that's on Saturday, August the 5th. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth, the Mass is ended. Thanks, Thanks be to be God. God. St. Michael the Archangel, defend, defend us, in, us battle. in battle. Be our protection, be our protection against, against the wickedness, the wickedness and, snares and snares of the devil. devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. And we also have two novenas that we're going to pray right now. I have to get the novena cards. The first novena is to our Marian martyrs, Blessed Anthony Leshevich and blessed George Kashira, who were two martyrs during World War II who gave their lives up for their parishioners. Prayer through the intercession of blessed Anthony Leshevich and blessed George Kashira, the Marian martyrs of Roshitsa. O God, merciful Father, in the hearts of your servants Anthony and George, you arouse such a great zeal for accomplishing corporal and spiritual deeds of mercy. Deign to grant to us through their intercession the grace for which we implore you. Prayer for the canonization of the blessed Anthony and George, 
most holy and undivided Trinity, you choose to live in the hearts of your faithful servants and after their death to reward their merits with the glory of heaven. Grant, we implore, that your servants Anthony and George, who with apostolic zeal faithfully serve the church under the patronage of the Immaculate Virgin Mary, may be numbered among the saints through Christ our Lord. Amen. And our second novena is a novena in preparation for the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Memorial of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. An act of consecration to the most sacred heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Most sacred heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary, I consecrate myself and my whole family to you. I consecrate to you my very being, my whole life, all that I am, all that I have, and all that I love. To you I give my body, my heart, and my soul. To you I dedicate my home and my country. Mindful of this consecration, I now promise you to live a Christian way of life by the practice of virtue. O most sacred heart of Jesus, and the immaculate heart of Mary, accept this act of consecration, which I make out of pure love for you. Immaculate heart of Mary, most sacred heart of Jesus, Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make my heart like unto your merciful heart. Amen. I'm Father Chris Aylar of the Marian Fathers, and I want to tell you about a grace I hope you don't let pass by. As a member of the Association of Marian Helpers, you can receive all the graces of our masses and prayers and penances just like you were a Marian priest or brother by decree of the Holy See. It doesn't cost anything, and it takes but a few seconds to sign up. Please visit micprayers.org or call us at 800-462-7426. God bless you. 